Hey guys, here's a video about natural frequency, driven oscillation, and resonance. And all those three things are all closely related to each other. And they're in section 14.7 of the book. So let's start off here with natural frequency first. All right, the concept of natural frequency is the uh, frequency at which an object oscillates if it's after it's been disturbed. Uh, and we'll see here that every object has a natural frequency or some combination of natural frequencies. It's easier to show than to tell. So let's get out a bigger camera here. There we are. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I have a, a meter stick here with a weight uh, attached to the top of it. And if I disturb it, it starts to sway. And this obviously is simple harmonic motion. It's just kind of doing what it does. And this frequency for this object, this is its natural frequency. When I disturb it, this is the frequency where how it, it oscillates. Okay, so that is a natural frequency. Um, now I said sometimes it has a combination of natural frequencies. This thing only has one. Really, when we bump it, it just sways like that. But if we take a, uh, a an object like a piece of wood, this does not make a pure tone because it has a combination of natural frequencies. There's several ways that this thing naturally vibrates and they all happen at the same time. Um, it's also kind of a dull thing because there are damping forces within the thing that keep it from vibrating for very long. This does not have very many damping forces, so it sways for a long time before it eventually slows down and stops. But this one has more. Now, Another example would be a tuning fork. A tuning fork is designed to have one particular natural frequency. This one is 512 hertz. That's a C, a middle C. So I think this shows up on the uh, in the sound. Um, this makes a very pure tone because its natural frequency is precisely 512 hertz. Okay. So every object has a natural frequency or some combination of them. And that determines the tone that it makes when uh, when, when, it's, when it's struck or disturbed. Um, okay, now we move on to the next idea, which is um, driven oscillation. It is possible for me to make this thing, force this thing to oscillate at something other than its natural frequency. And the technical term for that is a driven oscillation. So... It wants to do this, but if I want to, I can make it go slower. I'm driving it at some frequency other than its natural frequency, or I can make it go faster, whatever. Um, that's called a driven oscillation. Um, now, driven oscillation comes up in uh, in several contexts, but one example here, again, with the uh, with the tuning fork and the uh, and the whiteboard. This whiteboard has a particular natural frequency. But if I hit the, um, uh, the tuning fork, I can make the whiteboard oscillate, vibrate at the tuning fork's frequency. So the tuning fork is driving an oscillation in the, uh, in the, um, the piece of uh, wood here, the board. I'll do it again. So... I have to keep on talking while I do this because the uh, electronics and the computer take out background noise like tuning forks. Um, but as long as I keep talking, it has trouble distinguishing. So the sound still comes. So that's why I'm talking while I'm, while I'm doing this. Let's try it again. Okay. So the quick brown fox jumps over lazy dogs. The quick brown fox jumps over lazy dogs. And the tuning fork makes more noise when it touches the sounding board. Um, lots of musical instruments work on this principle. Uh, guitars. Uh, the string doesn't make a very loud noise, but if you can force the air in the guitar and the wood structure of the guitar to uh, to oscillate at the driving frequency of the string, it amplifies the sound. It makes it louder. There's some other things going on there too, but uh, we, we do use this in, in lots of uh, musical instruments. Okay, hopefully that part came through. We'll see when I get to the editing. Um, all right, so we have uh, natural frequency and driven oscillation. Now, when we combine both of these things, uh, then we get it. We get the phenomenon of resonance. Okay, so what I have here is some rubber bands. Yeah, they show up. And as you can see, when I pull on the rubber bands, I don't deflect the stick very far. You might be able to see that it goes a little bit when you compare it to the uh, the line in the background there. But I think you'll agree the rubber band does not pull this thing over very far. However, 
if I drive the frequency, that was smooth. Let's try that again here. If I pull on this rubber band to drive the stick at its natural frequency. So this is a driven oscillation, but the driven oscillation matches the stick's natural frequency. And as you can see, now it's moving quite a lot. It's moving much more than the rubber band by itself can make it move. And this phenomenon is called resonance. The stick is now resonating. Now, a couple things to point out here. As I do this, the oscillations, the amplitude is getting greater and greater. And if I do this enough, I may be able to break the stick. I don't wanna break the stick, so I'm gonna stop now. So when an object resonates like this stick, the amplitude tends to increase. It doesn't always increase because if there are damping forces that stop the vibration faster than I can make it build, then it won't resonate. So if there's, if there's damping forces involved, it won't always resonate. But an object can resonate if it's uh, if it is driven at a at its natural frequency. So an object can resonate if it if a driven oscillation matches its natural frequency, and the amplitude of the oscillation tends to increase as the thing resonates. Uh, we care about resonance very much when we build structures because we like structures to remain stable uh, and stationary for the most part. Um, and, uh, but if things will resonate in a high wind or an earthquake or when a bunch of people are walking across a bridge in step or a car is driving across a bridge at, uh, at uh, the proper speed, um, that can be really, really bad because the structure can start to shake and it can literally shake itself apart. Okay. Yep, that's all we got. All righty, uh, so now we're gonna have you watch a uh, video uh, about a rather extreme example of a, uh, a structure resonating. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge, dedicated in 1940, was the pride of the Northwest. Then, the third longest suspension span that became known as Galloping Gertie, as it swayed in the winds sweeping up Puget Sound. Four months after it was opened, those winds sent the bridge into a rhythmic dance of death. It literally shook itself to pieces. Caught in the middle of the bridge was a Tacoma newspaper man. The bridge twists and sways in its death agony. Since its opening, engineers have studied ways to end its strange vibrations. They claim to be on the threshold of success, but too late. The reporter, Leonard Coatsworth, manages to fight his way to safety, most of the way on his hands and knees. He abandoned his car with a pet dog inside, the only life lost in the disaster. Giant cables are under stupendous strain as the great roadway of the bridge whips about like some fluttering ribbon. These pictures have been acclaimed as some of the greatest ever filmed. Here it goes. a six and a half million dollar dream. Theories were many, but the consensus was that the solid side railings were responsible. A twin bridge on the east coast, New York's Whitestone, has side railings that allow the wind to blow through. A footnote to history, the bridge was torn down for scrap and a new one built, but Galloping Gertie will always be remembered. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. And you may have seen that before. It's a very famous video. Uh, it's particularly famous in engineering schools. If you're gonna be studying civil engineering or even architecture, you're always gonna see this one because it was really a lesson learned. This was a landmark thing. At the time this bridge was built, suspension bridges were a new technology and they hadn't worked all the bugs out yet. And that's the way it is with any new technology. So yeah, this shape here is not what you want your bridge to look like. Um, now, a couple things here. Um, when this happened, I want to make sure you understand this. This happened because the bridge resonated. The bridge was resonating. The wind speed that day was just right to make the bridge uh, oscillate at its natural frequency. And the amplitude of those oscillations increased to the point where it brought down the structure. Um, now, they 
said in the um, in the newsreel here that this uh, bridge had been known to shake before this, but this particular day was different. Uh, usually in the past, the waves would just go from one tower to the other and back again. It would kind of do something like this. Um, but this particular day, then it started doing this weird twisting thing, and that was new. Um, and that uh, did uh, wind up uh, bringing the bridge down. Now, when this happened, then they started looking at other suspension bridges that had been built around the world, like the Golden Gate Bridge in uh, San Francisco, which at the time was the longest suspension bridge in the world. Um, and they looked at him to say, well, could this happen with other bridges? And it turned out that, yeah, you just need to have the right wind speed sustained for the right amount of time. So the way that they solved this and fixed this was by modifying the bridges so that one section of the span will have one natural frequency and then another section of the span will have a different natural frequency. So if the wind speed is flowing at the right speed to make one part start to resonate and do this, um, then the other part of the span will damp out the frequency because it's not resonating. It's the frequency is right for the other half of the bridge to resonate. And then likewise, if the other half of the bridge is able to resonate because it's a different storm, a different wind speed that day, then the first half of the bridge will damp it out. And that's a way to uh, greatly reduce the, uh, the hazard of this sort of thing happening. Um, so yeah, they modified bridges and they learned how to do it. And uh, um, modern suspension bridges don't do this anymore. It's, as we know. Um, another thing that they did is they made the bridge deck thicker. You can see on this one and in the, uh, uh, in the uh, um, different angles during this video that the bridge deck was very thin. They wanted to make it look very thin and graceful like a ribbon. Um, and they realized that that just doesn't give it enough stiffness to, to withstand this sort of thing. So yeah, they made uh, modifications to suspension bridge design and it doesn't do that anymore. So anyway, what does that bring us to here? Uh, we have, uh, we looked at resonance and natural frequency. There we go. So natural frequency, driven oscillation, and resonance. Um, hope you found that interesting. There are four or five homework problems. Looks like four homework problems that you'll have to do that are in the chapter that deal with this. Look at it from different angles. But that's it. So thank you for your time, and we'll see you next time.